Looks like it's going to be a pretty easy game, man. Huh? You wish. You really wish. I would put Sekiro from this year. Bruce Wayne and Batman, two big shoes. And he felt games could probably help calm me. Because in India, gaming is an act of privilege. So first of all, thank you for joining us on the podcast. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure being here. And thanks for having me again. So uh, you mentioned that you know you never gain for a living. On the other side, you're also a professor, right? So that kind of comes across like a Bruce Wayne by day, Batman by night sort of thing, uh, story. So and uh, would you agree that at least in the Indian society, gaming is seen as a lot of uh, stigma. In the sense, parents got, are not very fond of their uh, children pursuing it as a career. So for you, how has the journey been? And then you know when you meet someone new, and you mentioned that you uh, review video games for a living. How has the experience been? And how has your journey been through so far? And, you know, have your parents completely accepted that this is what you do and they're okay with it? Uh, so this is a very interesting uh, question. So, yeah, again, Bruce Wayne and Batman, two big shoes for me to fill in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, let's get that right off the bat. But the fact is what you're saying is right. Uh, gaming in India is often seen as a very trivial pursuit. Let's be very honest about it. Nobody takes it seriously. Okay. Uh, I remember I was at this conference uh, called the IAMCR, which is one of the biggest conferences for communication in the world. And uh, I was presenting my work on games research. And somebody asked me when I kind of closed the presentation, is this research valid for people who are, you know, above 14 or 15 years of age? So, which is significantly problematic because now that if you, I mean, there's one way we can always keep calling it trivial or, you know, simple or something that doesn't matter. Um, or, you know, uh, what our parents really like to call it, a waste of time. We can always keep calling it that. Or we can accept the fact that today, one in three people in the world play games. And that's more than the number of people who watch television. Okay. Uh, in terms of revenue, the gaming industry is bigger than the film industry today. So now if movies and television can be taken seriously, I think it's about time we start taking this seriously, at least from a if not for anything, at least for a bottom line kind of perspective. The industries make more money today. It's pegged at, I think, 163 billion in 2019. Expected to go up to 200 billion by 2021. Okay, and those are big numbers. Uh, there's no denying that fact. And moving away from that, so since you asked how it was growing up, it was very difficult. So I remember my uh, mother spending a huge chunk of money so that I could buy my first computer. It was a Pentium 3 in 97. I don't even think you guys were born around that time. But uh, in 97, a Pentium 3 was the state-of-the-art computer. And I used to play a lot of games on it. And one of my favorite ones was this game called Hidden and Dangerous. Along with that, I used to play this thing called uh, uh, Delta Force. And quite a few games. Uh, there was Road Rash, if you guys remember. Um, yeah, so at some point, they decided that, you know, I was playing it too much. I was getting addicted to it and it's not their fault. Uh, I used to come back from school, not have food, sit and play and all my friends used to surround me and this used to go on till 9 p.m., 10 p.m. till they used to come back from work and realize, oh my God, this is what he's done all day. He's not even had lunch. So at some point they decided enough was enough and I was sent off to boarding school. So boarding school was kind of like a digital detox. At least they hoped that, you know, the gaming part of me would go away. I did play sports and a lot of other things happened. But uh, when I came back, uh, at least for some reason, I was able to balance gaming. I didn't stop, but I didn't obsess over it the way I used to before I went. So I used to take two, three hours in a day out to do this because I really liked it. I was passionate about it, but it didn't consume me so much anymore. Uh, and that balance, I think, has worked. So games have always been a part of my life. And I started gaming really early because my father kind of felt that I had early signs of ADHD and he felt games could probably help calm me. And I started off with the early Game Boys and the, if you remember the Sega uh, television control, Contra and games like that. And that's where I kind of began. And so they've always been a significant part of my life. And so when I finished my master's, and this is funny because my master's degree is in communication. But one of the courses I kind of uh, specialized in was new media and digitality, cyber culture. Uh, so then I kept thinking in the year after my master's, as I had just begun teaching, uh, what is it that I should do to try and connect to my doctoral work? And this seemed like a very logical path. That, you know, 
since I have an expertise in new media and digitality and I understand how online works and how identity works and all of that works. Probably connected to my favorite hobby, that's gaming, and forged that path. And the more I kind of looked at it, there was very little work at it. And I'm talking about 2012, 2013, so hardly any work for that matter. So it worked and I, then I had the difficult uh, task of finding a supervisor willing to guide me. It took me a year to convince her. But it happened and then three and a half years later, the degree came, I guess. So, so one thing I'd like to ask is, you yourself said how, you know, you got addicted to gaming when you were introduced to it. I mean, how do people, like the young generation, you know, stop themselves from getting addicted that way? And another thing is, uh, if you're talking about sports like football, cricket, etc., there's no denying the fact that these sports... Uh, take care of the fact that you remain physically fit, which is something that is not there in gaming. So, I mean, how do you fight those arguments, whether it's about mental or physical health uh, adversely being affected by gaming? So there are two levels to it. Okay, uh, um, The addiction part, uh, I'm not an expert in it, I'm being honest. Also, I'm not a psychologist. So a lot of work that comes with games and addiction comes from the psychology uh, discipline and you know the uh, psychological perspective of things but i accept one thing for sure that you know games are immersive and engaging very immersive and very engaging now if you try and compare games to other recreational activities that came before them so you look take a look at sports or you take a look at uh, you know um, just the act of play the physical act of play both of them had two things which are very important the fact that they were physically exhausting activities. So while you're playing your favorite game of cricket or football, which is amazing, at some point your body will tell you we can't do this anymore. So you'll stop and probably take call it a day. Now with games that doesn't really happen. The exhaustion probably is more mental than physical. Correct? So as long as you know you're engaged and immersed, you lose track of time and space. What we kind of call the magic circle. You kind of go into that space where it's just you and the game. And What's beyond that doesn't happen. Uh, like my mother keeps pointing me out once in a while, you know, you lose track of everything. I keep yelling at you, but you still keep playing. Because I haven't even heard her, right? And most gamers will probably agree with this fact that you haven't even heard her. I mean, yeah. So, what you're telling is true. The potential for addiction with games is more than any other platform. And there's no denying that because there has been no other platform that's as engaging as this so far. So it combines everything that television, video, audio, radio, all of them offer. Correct. And then gives you the option to interact with it infinitely. Which other platform offers that? Nothing else, right? So you get what I'm trying to say. I mean, uh, if you try and connect it to something like postmodernity and fluidity, no other platform is as fluid or as interactive or as open to uh, manipulation like this one is. So that's a very relevant fact. Now, how do we tackle this is a big problem. So if you remember, uh, there were governments which are trying to, within the country which are trying to get PUBG banned during board exams. What else could they do? I mean, parents are worried for their children, right? Correct. So I think the only way we can kind of tackle this is if parents are aware of what children do in their leisure time. You know, to be actively aware. So if your parents know what games are and they understand how important it is for you to play the game that you want to. Between the two of you, you can negotiate a time limit there. If you go in with the straight point of view that he or she is just wasting time and all the effort they are putting in the game is a waste of time and energy and resources, it's very likely you'll get a, reb you know, a rebellious kind of attitude back from the uh, person who is playing the game as well. Okay? So, this is a very dicey situation. So, I mean, for the first time, I think, we are in a generation where technology has kind of leapfrogged so much that there is a proper divide of understanding between leisure activities. So it's probably difficult for, you know, parents of uh, kids today or children today to understand what binge watching is, for example. Unless they actually do it. Similarly, it's very difficult for them to understand how, what video games are unless they actually play it. So the good thing, I guess, is, you know, um, the prime generation of today, the millennials at least, most of them have played some form of games. 
growing up and you will agree with me as well i guess though i don't know if you are millennials though uh, but yeah you we have all played games on some level so when you know the next generation after us does it we probably know what it means so we probably know how to tell them to you know build boundaries to build walls to sustain yeah how did you make the transition from being a casual gamer and uh, to realize this is something you want to do for a living when did that happen see yeah now that casual hardcore binary you know is not something i yeah i believe in okay. i'm being very honest so a lot of my research actually talks about dismantling that and the success of you know games like pubg fortnite is clear indication that you know casual gamers are here to stay but if going by that old school uh, industry definition of hardcore games i think i've fit in that now because i play the latest and greatest i have probably the latest hardware to do it and all of that so i kind of fit in that mold and you're right so making that transition was difficult very difficult because in india gaming is an act of privilege let's not deny that fact the only people who can probably play games seriously are upper middle class people or people who who are financially very well to do probably in the 1% okay because not only do you need access to the platform you need the technological know how to operate those platforms you need the access to the internet you need access to the latest information on how to play that game correct and all these four have to come together for you to even begin playing so you understand the level of privilege that comes there correct so there's no denying that fact uh, and i have been very very fortunate i guess that it worked out for me then now to transition from someone who just plays games to someone who is points of view are taken seriously you know what you would technically say uh, as someone who can whose voice matters little at least one small voice of sorts in the gaming space uh, extremely difficult again uh, i guess the research helped considerably the fact that you know i was not one of these uh, i was not one of the tech journalists who was trying to be a gaming person but i was actually someone who was trying to understand how games are made built how the mechanisms function so even the kind of perspectives i offer with the games i analyze are different they talk about design they talk about the challenge they talk about what was probably fun in transitioning something so that's the kind of thing that happened but i would still you know be a little yeah uh let's say a little uncomfortable calling myself a hardcore gamer because uh sadly i do not have the time to uh, master games anymore okay and while i put in considerable time i still play 2 3 hours a day no matter how hectic life gets so there have been times when i have woken up at 4 in the morning to just play games for the next 2 3 hours and a lot of uh, the last year has been that but you know i'm not at the level probably that i used to be at some point 